Welcome to the conference. This is AMI Inside. The TELUS Digital Building in downtown Toronto was the host of A11YTO's very first conference. One of the co-organizers of the event was Billy Gregory. We have roughly 300 people here. We're completely blown away and flattered and again Toronto has stepped up and delivered big time when it came to supporting us. A11YTO is an organization dedicated to the field of digital accessibility. So we provide really three things. Meetups are sort of just quick one-off little lessons for people to learn about accessibility. Uh, the, the camps, that, that's where we get together and we share ideas and we try to grow the community and we bring in new voices and we encourage people who haven't spoken before to share those ideas. And then conferences where the professionals come to learn. So we have designers, we have developers, we have uh, project managers and they're all here today. So our, our, our focus here for conferences is actionable takeaways. We want people to come here and learn a bunch of new stuff they can take back to their work and immediately start using. We've got talks from a lot of different presenters over the next couple of days. We have people that flew here from Germany, from Tokyo, from all over the UK, from all over the US, just to talk about accessibility. That's how important it is, and that's the impact I was hoping to make. I was hoping that we could prove that Toronto is not just a hotbed, but a magnet for accessibility, and people are just drawn to it from everywhere. Leonie Watson is Communications Director and Principal Engineer at the Passiello Group. A writer and frequent conference speaker, Leonie travelled from Bristol, United Kingdom, to deliver the keynote address. I hear a lot of people saying, we've got to make accessibility cool. We've, we've got to get everybody kind of just really excited about accessibility. And I love that idea. But not having been one of the cool kids at school, I'm painfully aware that you can't just decide to be cool and hope everybody goes along with it. Life would have been a lot easier at school for me if that had been the case. But we, we feel compelled to try and generate interest and excitement in accessibility. I'm not sure saying that it's got to be cool is really the best way to go about it, but I do think there are other possibilities that we can perhaps do that will create coolness uh, as a result of, or a byproduct of doing different things. We need to grow up in our profession. The web itself is still relatively new. It's just uh, a couple of decades old. Accessibility, in some respects, is a little bit younger still. So we're kind of at the stage, I think, where we're in our, our teenage years. We're sort of finding out who we are and, and what life means to us and, and where our place in society or our place in the web really is. But I think we also have to grow and mature our profession. And we can't be afraid to uh, you know, use this as a business concept. One of my colleagues not long ago was asked at a conference you know, how they could justify being an accessibility professional and charging for accessibility services when, at the end of the day, accessibility was so important as a civil right and a means of independence to so many people with disabilities. And the short answer is, is that we have to. We need to create a profession out of this because there are not enough of us to do this in our spare time and our lunch hours. We need to make a business out of it and indeed many companies are successfully doing that. But we need more of us so we need to create professional bodies. We need to have all the things that go hand in hand with being a professional uh, thing in, in the space of the web. So we need to keep that growing up happening and uh, eventually get ourselves to the point where accessibility is a career that someone at school may set out to uh, go into when they look to their future. As professionals working in this industry, it's really very hard when there's this constant legal threat uh, hovering over our shoulders. That's not really a very comfortable way to work. Now, of course, we can do lots in our working lives to uh, mitigate that risk. But actually, from a consumer point of view, there's another interesting angle to this. Speaking myself as someone who is blind, it isn't actually the inaccessibility of a product often that will make me think of turning to my solicitor or my lawyer. It's the response I get when I talk to the people who've created that product. Uh, a good example recently is that I had uh, a problem with an airline website and uh, mobile app. Uh, the mobile app wouldn't let me check in with voiceover enabled on my iPhone. And despite repeated attempts to contact this organization, they repeatedly kept dismissing me, telling me nobody else had reported accessibility problems, which I knew to be untrue. Nobody on their web team or their mobile team was aware of any accessibility problems, therefore there couldn't be any accessibility problems. I went to my solicitor. I can't tell you about the rest, but <laughs> the point is, it wasn't the inaccessibility of the product. We, we know we have accessibility challenges when we're building things, financial you know, limitations, time limitations. So more often than not, it isn't 
the accessibility problem in itself that causes the need to turn to your lawyer or your solicitor. It's the response you get from an organization, and that's a really important thing to remember. If someone contacts you about an accessibility problem with something you've created, listen to them, try to understand it, respond positively, and most of all, make a commitment and stick to it to get that thing solved if you possibly can. Leonie reminded us of the value of pushing accessibility forward. If for no other reason than in the future, if you don't already, we're going to need accessibility for ourselves. It's a sad truth, of course, is that we get older, bits stop working, unfortunately. Um, some people get away with it more lightly than others, but sooner or later, there's a really good chance you're going to need to bump up the text size, turn up the volume, turn on some captions, all of those kind of things. So we have an investment in our own futures to think about accessibility. Except there's a bit of a kicker for those of us who are already working on the web. We've got used to using technology. As we get older, we are not going to have any patience, any tolerance for not being able to use technology. So we need to think about uh, not only designing stuff for our future selves or building a world where stuff is accessible, we need to make sure we educate and encourage the uh, practitioners who come behind us to make things accessible out of the box because we are not going to be tolerant of them not doing things accessibly when the time comes for us to need uh, them to have done so in our futures. The last message I guess I really want to share with you is for all the trials and tribulations, the challenges, the uncertainty, uh, the difficulties and the benefits, uh, please don't forget for a moment that the web is a magical world and the best thing we can do is put our accessibility hats on and get out there and explore it. Coming up next on AMI Inside. It's hot on this stage. <sighs> Excuse me, can I take off my shirts? AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. First of all, I'd like to thank you all in advance for your patience with my English. Makoto Wiki is a web accessibility consultant for InfoAxia Incorporated, a company in Japan. This is the first time for me to come to Canada. It has been very hot this week. <laughs> it's September, right? And it's still hot today, isn't it? <sighs> uh, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. But I think web accessibility is more than that. Web accessibility is about Everyone who is using your web. Everyone, including each of you in this room and me. Mm. It's hot on this stage. <sighs> Excuse me, can I take off my shirts? <laughs> One moment, please. <laughs> Sorry. Makoto appealed to sports fans in the audience when he removed an extra shirt he was wearing. Holy smoke! <laughs> I'm wearing Blue Jays baseball uniform. <laughs> What's going on? Okay, let's move on. Japan is the most rapidly aging country on this planet. According to the World Population Prospects published by uh, United Nations, Japan will be getting older and older in the near future. It is also said that in 2023, six years later, more than half of population in Japan will be 50 years old or older. Wow. Uh, let's take a look at the internet utilization ratio by age in Japan. The ratio of users in their uh, 60s and 70s are increasing gradually. Actually, they are using smartphones, tablets, as well as PC to access the web. And it is obvious that the internet users are aging. Many older people have age-related impairments that can affect how they use the web, such as declining vision, physical ability, hearing, and cognitive ability. I've been conducting usability testing with the elderly people for more than 10 years. I'd like you to learn a Japanese keyword. 
uh, during the usability testing, all the users often say this phrase, mendokusai, which means um, troublesome or tiresome, something like that. Repeat after me, please. Man. <laughs> okay, Toronto. <laughs> Man. Dog. Sai. Yes. Okay, Toronto. Yow. <laughs> this is important keyword to understand the issues all the people are facing on the web page. Today, I'm going to share the findings from the testings. The older users have difficulties in reading small text. The modern browsers provide the Zoom functionalities so that users can resize text when needed. But I've not seen the older users who use the Zoom function of the browsers. Um, even if the text on the web page is too small for them. They try to read it. Many Japanese websites provide resize text buttons in the upper right corner of the web pages. Especially government and local government websites are doing this. This might be helpful for older users, but they rarely hit these kind of buttons. Uh, the problem is it's inconsistency in the look and feel and the functionalities. Some button can resize text up to 200%, but most of them can resize text only up to around 120%. Almost no change. Okay? Some button can be activated several times, and text can be resized gradually. But in many cases, you can hit the button just once. This is too bad. Target size is important on the touch screen as well. All the users are using mobile devices such as smartphone and tablet. They are not good at touching small items as well as clicking on the small target. They would say, oh, this is really mendokusai. <laughs> so the touch target size must be large enough. Next one is using a drop-down or something to save the space on the web page. When there are a bunch of options user can select, we can save space on the web page by using the drop-down menu or drop-down list or something like that. This is a screenshot of a mlb.com website. I've seen many older users who don't open this kind of menu. It is a trade-off between saving space and making it findable. Uh, for forms, uh, it would be much better to use checkboxes uh, or radio buttons to present options to users visibly. Uh, the older users want to see every single option on the page without opening drop-down list or expanding menu uh, because they don't notice the item even if they noticed and opened the drop-down, they would say, this is mendokusai. Um, I got number 11 on my back. <laughs> Do you know why? Because it's A11Y. <laughs> okay? um, number 11 of Blue Jays is Kevin Peter. He is a super outfielder, center fielder. He has been showing a bunch of big plays and circus catch every year. And you know what? I can see how access web contents work for everyone in his play, assuming that uh, outfielders are web content. And uh, Kevin Peter, he's a super. So, uh, I would say he's accessible web content. <laughs> if your web content is accessible, then you can catch, you can catch many more opportunities. You can address wider range of user needs, user's context. So, yeah, let's be Kevin Peter. Number 11. <laughs> okay?
Thank you so much. Domo arigato. Coming up next on AMI Inside. Also, this unit has 22 languages available for OCR. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Hi. My name is uh, Cornel Johosa and I am the general manager of Optelec Canada. Optelec is a company which specializes in technology for people with blindness and low vision. They had a booth at the conference showcasing a variety of products. Some of the magnifiers that we have is just handheld magnifiers. Uh, we have electronical video magnifiers. We also have CCTVs, the reading machines. We have software, like I said, JAWS for blind people, ZoomText for low vision, software for the computer. And we also have OCR units, which is optical character recognition units. When I started with the company 14 years ago, uh, I used to uh, repair units that were built in the early 90s. So if we compare something from the 90s to something that we have right now, it's really day and night. Yeah, it's, you can't compare the technology. Every year the technology, you know, grows and uh, is advancing, but it's just, you know, unbelievable. Optelect's newest product is the Compact 6 HD Speech, a pocket-sized electronic magnifier. It has a 6-inch touchscreen and is only 14 millimeters thin. As soon as you open the stand, the magnifier will, will turn on automatically to be able to read. You can change the magnification of the print, you can change the color of the print, but also this unit has a second camera that allows you to take a full page uh, uh, in a picture and it will read it back to you. So it will do OCR. And to take the picture, you just have to put the unit on top of the page, press the right hand side button, the white button, and you see the image on the screen. You, place the, you, uh, you press the play button, and the unit starts reading the, the text. Also, this unit has 22 languages available for OCR. There's a speaker in the back of the unit, but this unit can also be connected via Bluetooth with headphones. We started showing this product last week and this week in, in different shows across Canada, uh, out west and here in, uh, in Ontario. And we've gotten uh, uh, we've got a really positive uh, feedback because uh, the image is very clear and the OCR, it's something that it's, uh, it's very clear as well because it's the OCR that we're using in uh, previous um, uh, units and it's something that we've uh, tested you know, for the past five years, I would say. Hi, my name is Lynn Vizard and I'm a service designer at Bridgeable. My grandmother, Patricia, was an incredible woman. She was super accomplished. Among other things, she had an Olympic medal in archery. She was an embroiderer and artist who sold her work all around the world. And she was also a keen ornithologist. She loved birds. She lived in a small coastal town in Northern Ireland, and she liked to go to sit by the ocean and listen to the birds. But she couldn't actually get down to the beach or the waterline. Because after contracting polio in the women's RAF in World War II, she spent the rest of her life using a wheelchair. I saw these accessibility mats on Twitter. Um, one image is of them being used on a beach in Brazil, and they're also being piloted in Vancouver at the moment. And I thought about how much this would have meant to someone like my granny. Access to the beach and to the seaside is a service. It's an exchange of intangible value. It's not a product that you buy or a website that you visit. And yet it's so, so precious. I'm telling you all of this because I'm struggling with a question. And the question I have is, what do accessible services look like? And how can I play my part in designing them? I call myself a designer. I used to design websites and apps. This work was how I discovered the world of digital accessibility. Now, I'm still a designer, but I call myself a service designer. As a consultant, I'm part of designing services that are not necessarily digital only. 
things like the process of renewing your cell phone contract, or signing up and accessing the library, or the application process to a charitable fund. So when I started doing this type of work in services, I figured people must be thinking about how to make these services accessible and inclusive. What are service designers saying about this? So I tried to look for resources. For example, I went on the Service Design Network uh, global site. Um, this is the global practitioner body for people doing the kind of work that I do. Um, and I figured maybe I could search for accessibility resources. They have lots of journal articles and talks. And I got one result. Not cool. Service design, like lots of other design, claims to be human-centered. Designers love talking about that we put human needs at the center of our work. But sometimes you really have to wonder, which humans are we talking about? So this is Sinead Burke. She's a blogger and activist. And at 105 centimeters tall, she recently gave a TED talk about how the design of the world around her affects her life. So one example is she often can't reach the lock on bathroom doors or the sink or toilet. So she jokes, her new job is reviewing bathrooms. And this is not good design. We often think about disability as being the permanent physical sort. The truth is that disability is actually about mismatched human interactions. It's not about personal health conditions. It's about when the design of a service or product or website or environment doesn't meet your needs. So when we think about better matching those interactions in a service, we need to think about the digital bits and the non-digital bits. That's the technical terminology. <laughs> um, I do want to point out that the digital parts of a service are crucial, and the work that this community is doing to make those accessible is a crucial piece of the puzzle. But services often unfold across more than just a digital touch point. So the example of airlines, you know, you might book online or check in online, but then you need to actually go to the airport, go through security screening, board the plane, and actually fly. For that service to deliver the value that you want from it, it has digital and non-digital components. How do we get here? Somewhere where accessibility and inclusion are an integrated part of all design decisions. To a place that's truly human-centered, that considers all humans. Lynn provided examples of how services were made more accessible for people. After Sinead gave her TED talk, one of the theaters she frequents put some stools in the bathroom stalls. So that means that Sinead can now reach the lock on the bathroom door. This makes a huge difference. Simple, cheap intervention that means Sinead can go out and enjoy an evening out at the theater. London Underground has recently issued um, a map of the tube system designed to support people with claustrophobia and anxiety. It highlights which parts of the tube system are underground. So they haven't changed the service at all. They've just made information available in a way that allows people to make choices about their routes to better suit their needs. And in Madrid, the subway map shows stations with quote unquote annoying stairs with a skull and crossbones symbol. <laughs> Which made me wonder if there's such a thing as a not annoying stairs. <laughs> People have been finding ways to make services and products accessible for a long time. People like designers who participate in making things need to get better at considering accessibility and inclusion. Because it's really not good enough. And I think we've heard that it's, you know, we're still not there. It's still not good enough. Let's be design leaders so that people like my granny can get down to the waterfront and listen to the birds. And let's think about what accessibility and inclusion looks like on screen and beyond. Coming up next on AMI Inside. There's nothing like it. Most of the testing tools are single document. Well, we're looking at tens of thousands, if not more, files at once. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Hi, I'm Adam Spencer, Head of Accessibility Services for Accessible IT, and today we're launching a revolutionary new product to test PDF accessibility in the enterprise. One of the biggest shortfalls in the document accessibility space is testing tools. 
And this has been a need that we've identified years ago. And about four years ago, we started concepting, how do we fix this problem? Everyone's focused on web, so we wanted to focus on PDF because that's our specialty. So we developed a new product that allows large enterprise to test unlimited documents with one click and determine whether they're accessible and compliant or not. The new product is called UA Spy. There's nothing like it. Most of the testing tools are single document. Well, we're looking at tens of thousands, if not more, files at once. So we can run a scan so organiza organizations can really track what's going on, whether they're following the law or not. When an organization, particularly in Ontario, has to comply with legislation like the AODA, they don't, if they're not making their content accessible, they're effectively breaking the law. So we really look at ourselves as helping our organization or our clients mitigate risk. By understanding where they're not accessible, they can now focus their time resourcing and, and even outsourcing to us uh, at Accessible IT their documents so that they can be accessible and compliant under the law. Adam talked about who UA Spy is geared toward. Every ministry in the provincial government, banks, insurance companies, um, really you name it, any organization employing more than 20 people in the province has to comply. Our first run on this was with the German federal government. So we ran every single ministry and now they know what's accessible and what isn't. What's been amazing is how companies can finally say, oh, we didn't even know we had files there, let alone whether they were accessible or not. It's really allowing them to engage at a much more granular level with the documents rather than saying, yeah, we have some files over here and we don't know whether they're good or not. We don't have staffing to figure out whether they're in good shape or whether we're in big trouble. So that's been one of the biggest pieces that we've seen come out. Organizations now know where to draw a line. This is where we're starting and now we know what our goal is. The biggest issue facing end users is that so many organizations are producing inaccessible content. They don't know where to start. They don't know what they don't know. And this allows them to say, okay, we've got a big problem. We need to, to develop a document accessibility strategy to make our content accessible so that the end user has barrier-free access to all content. A lot of organizations and, and quite frankly, a lot of web accessibility specialists forget that documents still represent a huge part of what we do online. There are over a billion PDFs generated every day. It's not going anywhere. So we've got to do something with it to make sure that screen reader users and people with print disabilities have access to that content. It's required. Everyone needs to fill it out or, or read that content. So why, why aren't you making it accessible? It's not an afterthought. So I'm going to talk to you about accessibility, no rights without responsibilities. Nick Steenhout is the owner of Part of the Whole, a company through which he provides web accessibility consulting. The question is, who has rights? Well, how about everyone? Everyone has rights. We're talking about people with disabilities have rights, right to access, but we're talking also about developers. They have a right to know what's going on. They have a right to actually get the information from people with disabilities when it doesn't work. Um, by the same token, when we ask who has responsibilities, well, we, we, we all have responsibilities. You know? We can all be superheroes and fix the web. So it's not just the responsibility of the developer, it's the responsibility of people with disabilities and every single other stakeholders in, in the process. Of course, it's not always that simple because people with disabilities often, we don't speak up. We go to a website, it doesn't work, and we start screaming at our website or we start bitching at our friends or we just you know, throw our hands in the air and we move on to the next website which is actually more accessible. We don't speak up because it often feels pointless, a little bit like a door in the middle of a field which has nothing around it. Uh, it feels pointless because we can't find ways to actually talk to the uh, website owners, to the developers. It feels pointless because we're going to hear, oh yeah, I, actually that's a really good problem you raised. We, we'll look into it. And then you contact them two months later. Oh, we haven't really quite gotten the time to look into it. Or, yeah, we'll fix it. And, and then six months later, nothing's been done. So it, it kind of build this feeling of why should I bother? We're really stuck in a vicious circle. People with disabilities don't want to talk about it. Developers don't want to know about it. And 
in the end, we're just all ignorant about what's going on. Nick advised how stakeholders and developers could help bridge this gap. Make it easy for people to send you feedback. And that means you can give an email link, you can give an email form, you can have a discussion forum, but make it clear that you want to know from your user, hey, does it work from an accessibility perspective? Does it work from a usability perspective? Does the site work for my grandmother? Does it so work for my 10-year-old? Does it work for everybody at large? So it, when you're starting to think about getting feedback, it's not just about accessibility anymore. It's about the whole range of users. And the idea here is to improve your website. The other thing is, once you get that feedback, listen to it. You know? It's good, people are wanting to tell you about it, but listen to the feedback. Uh, yesterday I had taxi driver. He was wanting to be very helpful. And he kept moving my bags from the ground onto my lap. And I said, no, I don't want this. I'm not ready for my bags. I want to put my harness on my dog first. And I said, no, thank you. And he said, but let me help you. And he put the bags on my lap again. That's this kind of very frustrating experience that happens on the web again. In real life, on the web, it's all mixed in. So as developers, as stakeholders, if somebody tells you, this works for me, don't change it, don't go and change it on them. And if they tell you, this doesn't work for me, well, listen to that and figure out an answer to how to fix it. Now, for people with disabilities, um, there's a lot of things we can do better. Now, I said earlier, we don't speak up. And I'm going to say, folks, do speak up. Do take the time. And chances are, as an individual with disability, you're not going to encounter 75 different barriers on all the sites you're going to. You're going to encounter the same two, three, maybe four barriers over and over and over again. If you really feel like screaming at the website, say that to the developer. Maybe it'll impart a little bit of sense of urgency. Of course, remain polite. Um, you will attract more flies with honey than vinegar, as we say. Uh, so it pays to be polite because it will be better received. Uh, if somebody yells at you, chances are you're just going to say, nope, don't want to know. Um, but it's all right to make your feelings known. It's all right to say, this has been a really frustrating experience. What it comes down to, I think, for me, is education and awareness building from people with disabilities to the developers, to the stakeholders, to the site owners. It's this concept that if I say, my grandmother isn't able to look at the time of arrival of a plane on your website. It's one thing. If I say, my grandmother wasn't able to actually uh, get the help she needed to be able to be there to get me at the airport, and without her being there, I was not able to go from the airport to her place, and therefore, we ended up with five hours of extreme stress, and that had an impact on me, and that had an impact on my 95-year-old grandmother. Suddenly, you start couching it in a term that actually explains the importance of this issue, the very real life impact the barrier has on someone. And, and when you start, as a developer, when you start understanding the life issues, the, the, the sometimes really dramatic and, and dangerous situation these kind of things cause, suddenly we start thinking, oh, well, maybe I'll take that five minutes to actually speak to my colleague or convince my boss that we need to spend three hours on fixing this. Coming up next on AMI Inside. So here we have an example of something which stops a particular user in their tracks from accessing content. And it's not AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Hi, I'm Henny Swan. I'm director of UX at the Passiello Group. Henny was the last speaker at the conference. 
But before Henny's presentation, the audience was given a live taste of a web series called The Viking and the Lumberjack, which pokes fun at failed attempts at accessibility. No pictures. No pictures. Co-stars of the show, Carl Groves and Billy Gregory, took to the stage, with Billy setting up a stanchion. Hold on. We have a very important message from the management we have to read before we can allow anything to continue today. Please put up the message, man. Please put up the message. Thank you. Please put up the message. It's, it's... This is a message from the management. If you identify as one of the following, we ask that you leave the auditorium with immediate effect. That means now, people. Now. Blind, blind, low vision, colorblind, use prescription glasses, suffer from chronic pain, have limited dexterity, no upper body movement, or deaf, hard of hearing, I'll say it louder if you're hard of hearing, <laughs> have dyslexia, struggle with reading, are autistic or have cognitive impairments, that's you, Bill, have RSI, use a mobile, forgot your headphones, use pin zoom, are hungover or drunk, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Well, this is awkward. Uh, you, you can go, you got glasses. Billy Shift. walked off the stage. Uh, you're totally hung over, so you can go. Making the point that right. almost everyone falls into these categories, including Carl. And I wear glasses for reading, so I guess that's me done. I have to take them off, otherwise I won't see you. Uh, anybody else identify with any of this? Stick your hand up, make some noise, do whatever you need to do. <laughs> right. Thank you. It always amazes me that organizations spend time and money and resource on advertising and marketing to entice us to go and use their wonderful website or application and then literally at the last minute just stick that passive aggressive velvet rope across the door so you just can't get in. So WCAG tends to focus on code over design, output over outcome, technology over outcome, compliance over experience. And I think historically, we've thought of accessibility as being more of a developer sport, more of something that we QA towards the end of the pro product, uh, project, not something that we design in from the outset. And I'm not just talking about good contrast, focus states, etc. What I'm talking about are, are we including the right features that are really going to enable people to get to the end of this form quicker? Behind every great site or application lies thought. Empathy and inclusion, this does not happen by accident, it happens by design. Now, this sounds well and good, I work with design teams all the time, um, and they're like, well great, but how, how do we know if we're putting enough thought into it? How do we know if we're putting enough empathy into it? How do we know if we're really making it inclusive? It's not really enough to go and talk to designers and say, hey, can you please do all these things outlined in WCAG? That could get us an accessible site, but it might not get us an accessible user experience. So a few of us in my team got thinking about this. And we decided that what we needed was some inclusive design principles, principles around which we could kind of hook our thinking into, where we could start looking at new products or new designs that are coming uh, across uh, our desks and start thinking about them in the context of these principles. It's not a checklist. I really want to emphasize that. It's not a checklist. It's there to kind of inspire and, and provoke more emphatic thought. So our first principle is choice. Consider providing different ways for people to compete tasks, especially those that are complex and non-standard. Does anybody know James Williamson? He is a, a web developer and designer and author at lynda.com, which I'm sure you're aware of is, is quite a, a major resource for learning. Now, James is a family man, a speaker, educator, and at the beginning of the summer, he wrote a blog, blog post called The Long Goodbye, uh, where he explained why he hadn't been going out and speaking at conferences and why he hadn't been recording uh, training and things like that because he has ALS. ALS is a, is a muscle disease where you get wastage. It's not reversible, it's not curable, so he's gradually losing, losing control of his body and his speech, etc. And he wrote a fantastic, another fantastic blog post about some of the issues he's, he encounters online. So let's look at this form. We have um, 
It's a, it's a login form. We have a, a label, email or username, positioned above the text input. Underneath that, we have the label password positioned above the text input. We have forgot password link and then a sign in button. Is this form accessible? Well, it has labels. Um, and let's say that they are programmatically associated with the text input. The labels are pretty clear. You, you know what to do when you read them. There's sufficient color contrast. It passes WCAG. But is it usable for someone like James? No, it's not. In his own words, the most frustrating input issue is not being able to see my password as I type. Whether I'm using voice dictation or a single finger on my keyboard, precise input is extremely difficult. This difficulty is increased when you introduce special characters and many of the requirements found in passwords. That's a frustration that I relate to. I'm sure many of us relate to that. So for him, accuracy is difficult. So you can simply provide a choice for him to choose to check his password before he goes and makes the error and has to go back, and that's hard work, by adding a show password button. Not something that you would typically associate with accessibility, but just gives that extra, extra lift for some people. Then we have control. People should be able to access and interact with content in their preferred way. This is Sam. He was four when, when this was taken. And this is Sam sitting in his wheelchair. It's a close-up. You can't really see his wheelchair. Uh, he has no uh, lower body movement. He was paralyzed at 18 months. I think it was at C2 uh, on his spine uh, from the neck downwards. Um, he can't breathe unaided, but he uses a switch device on his uh, wheelchair. And what you can't see, which is off screen, is uh, a tablet fixed to his wheelchair. Now, Sam li liked to play games and watch movies. This was incredibly important to him because he couldn't go outside and play with his friends, but his friends could come and play games with him. So that was a, that was a connecting thing for him as much as just entertainment. But the problem is, is a lot of games and a lot of TV apps don't allow you to choose your orientation. So if he's got the tablet fixed on the front of his wheelchair in portrait, and Netflix, for example, forces it to lay out, game over. He can't watch, the, he can't watch what he wants to watch, because he can't reach out and turn it around. Now, this is, a, this is interesting, because orientation, forced orientation, is not covered under WCAG 2.0. So here we have an example of something which stops a particular user in their tracks from accessing content, and it's not even touched by any set of guidelines. It is proposed in WCAG 2.1, so expect to see it soon. So access is not enough for Colin, Sam. We need to all level up, I think. It's, we, we've had the guidelines for you know years now, but we need to level up, and we need to go beyond compliance. And I want to leave you with one thought, which is you guys are the door people of your products. You are the ones who have the power to let people in or turn people away. Even if you feel like you don't because your organization doesn't support you in doing what you do, you can do your bit. We've, we've all got some space to do our bit. So I want yourselves to think about that like, you are the hosts, your products are the hosts. <coughs> and maybe we should stop thinking of people uh, with disabilities as users and start thinking of them as our guests. And I think if we start using that word guest in our heads, then we start thinking more about inclusion. I mean, there's no way you would invite someone around to your house, turn the heating off and serve them water and stale bread. I mean, that's not a great experience. So I think it's down to us. For more information about A11YTO and future events, go to a11yto.com. Narrator Melissa Keith, producers Randy Urban, Christian Urban, videographer Jeffrey Garriak, writer Christian Urban, editors Randy Urban, Andrew Antonello, integrated described video specialist Emily Harding, audio post Bruce Baclarian, Achira Karinde, Mark Phoenix, Santiago Moffat, created by Rebecca Ellison, Kelly McDonald, production supervisor Jennifer Johnson. Director of Production, Karen Nye. Director of Programming, AMI-TV, Brian Perdue. Vice President, Programming and Production, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2017, Accessible Media Incorporated.